But the other things that we do that are really silly when we do things with money is this whole list that I've got. You know, we, we, I talk to people, I talk, you got to remember, I talk to hundreds of people as a team for the money multiplier. We talk to thousands of people and we hear all sorts of crazy things, right? We'll be talking to somebody and we'll be asking them, you know, where are you putting your money? Oh, we'll put it into a 401k. Great. How much are you putting in there? We're maxing it out. Okay, great. I mean, that's something we're going to talk about, but you're maxing your 401k out. Great. So we got your savings down. How much are you actually like, what are you spending? Where's your money going on a monthly basis? Well, we got a visa. We got a discover. We got an Amex. We got a, a car loan. We got do, 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 and it goes right down. Oh, we got a boat and we got this. And I'm like, okay, what, what are the interest rates that you're paying on all these? Well, this credit card is 20%. This one's, this one, we got one of those 0% intro rates. Yep. For six months. But then after that, it jumps up to 29%. Car loans, 5%. Boom, boom, boom. Boat loans, 6%. But you're putting a max in your 401k and you got all these debts. So, whoa, here's your sign. Like you have a money problem because seriously, you're doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing. First off, putting your money in your 401k when you got all these debts, you're giving up your best dollars today. And you're doing that for a couple of reasons. People, when I ask them, why do you put money in a 401k? Well, I want to retire someday. That's the number one thing. Awesome. What does retirement look like to you? Oh, I don't know. I never thought about that. I just, I just got to get there. How can you get somewhere if you don't know where you're going, right? You're just going to get in the car and just drive bl blindly. Do you know what your retirement looks like? What does your perfect day actually look like? Because until you can tell me what your perfect day looks like, you have no idea what retirement is. Because retirement is you living your perfect day every day. That's what it is. It's nothing more. Retirement isn't what you see in the prudential commercials with the boat, the sailboat, you know, sailing off into the sunset. Because what happens to that person that sails off into the sunset, they get hit in that storm that's going on right now and they don't come back. That's right. Well, that's just, that's what we do. You know, retirement comes in many shapes and sizes, but to, to most people, retirement is being able to, having the freedom, the time freedom and the financial freedom to live your perfect day every day. So you need to define your perfect day. You need to understand what does your perfect day look like? Once you can tell me what your perfect day is, from the moment you wake up, what do you smell? What do you see? Who are you with? What do your sheets feel like? What do you hear? And then if you can do that throughout your entire day till the second you lay back down, you close your eyes, that's your perfect day. You should be able to live that day every day. That's retirement. But we've been tricked into thinking that retirement is a whole bunch of different things. Retirement is, I don't even know, people I don't even think know what retirement is. To me, it's that. So until you can figure that out, you don't know what it is. So what are we doing? We're putting money blindly over here in these financial companies, giving up control of that money to the financial company. Then for you giving up control, what are they doing with it? Well, they're using it. They use that money. They make money on it. But what else do they do? They charge you a fee. That's right. If you own mutual funds, ETFs, isn't there a fee? There is. 12B1 fees, management fees. I could keep going, but we'll stop right there. How much are those fees? Well, could be anywhere from 30 basis points up to over 2%, depending on the mutual fund. So many of us have been now tricked into doing the easy way in your retirement plans. And you guys don't have to admit it, but how many of you have money in your retirement plans going into one of those fancy dancy freedom 2020, freedom 2030s, retirement 2020, retirement 2031, that fully diversified fund that self adjusts as you get closer to retirement. How many of you have those? I know you do. I know you do. You don't even need to tell me. Here's your sign. Because those are some of the most expensive funds that there are. They, see, they make them seem really good, but why? Why? Fees, 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 they're expensive. They're, they're expensive because it does more. That's it. It's just set up. It's just a computer program running on the back end, but it's, they charge you more because, oh my gosh, it is fully diversified around what the day you're going to retire and the closer you get, it gets more conservative. Oh, well, yeah, you can just, you can do all that for me because I don't have time for that. I don't know anything about money. Folks, you all know way more about money than you give yourself credit for. You just have been taught to think that money is so complicated that you need to give up control to everybody else. And listen, why am I telling you this? Because I was that guy. I was that advisor that you gave up control of your money to. And what did I do? I put it into a basket of mutual funds, of ETFs, of stocks, of managed portfolio. I got paid a fee every single month on that. Check showed up in my mailbox. When the market went down, I kind of did this. Oh, well, hey, you know, you got to be in it the long haul. Markets go up, markets go down. We can't really predict where it's going to go. That doesn't sound so good to you. Never sounded good to me either. I'm just like, that's what I was taught to say. But that's how it works. You gave up control. You would have been much better off keeping control of that money, but because they've convinced you it's so complicated, you could never do it yourself. Hogwash. You could do it yourself. You absolutely could do it yourself. 150%. I can tell you how to do it. Buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. 
And now all of you are like, oh my God. No, 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 seriously. All kidding aside, that's what you got to do. You buy low. So with your 401k, what are you doing? Well, you systematically put money into it, right? And then when the market goes up and is at a high point, you put your money on the sideline, you move it out, you sell. Buy low, sell high. I didn't come up with this. Warren Buffett did. He's way smarter than me. Sell high, okay? That doesn't mean take your money out. This means put your money over on the sideline, put it in cash, put it in the treasury, whatever. And then wait. And when the market goes down like it did in March, what do you do? You buy low. And if you just did that, it didn't matter what you bought. Let's just say you picked, and I know this goes against diversification, but we're going to get into that. If you just did it to one fund, the S&P 500, you'd make a lot of money doing that. If you just, and you don't even know, need to know when it's high and when it's low. All you need to do is watch, watch the news. When is it, when are people freaking out that the market's going down? With people freaking out in March? Darn right. That's when you should have been buying. When people are all pop, pl piling their money in and everything's going good and the unemployment rates are down and everything seems like it's just never going to end. That's when you got to be fearful. He also, Warren Buffett says, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. The don't lose money part just comes with following one and two. He also goes on to say, be greedy when others are fearful. In March, when there's a lot of fear, that's when you should have been greedy. But right now, when there's a lot of greed, you should be fearful. You just got to do the opposite almost of everything you've been taught because you've been just taught to give up control. Here's your sign. What else have you been taught to do with your 401k? Well, didn't they tell you you get a pre-tax deduction? So all the money that goes in the 401k, you don't pay tax on that. The money you get paid and then the money goes right in your 401k before it's taxed, then you're taxed and you get your paycheck. You're like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. I don't have to pay tax today. What the? Well, yeah, sign me up. Put it all in there. How much can I put in? Great. All of it. Put 20% in. Well, what are you actually doing? Would you rather pay tax? That's a trick question. Would you rather pay tax on the seed or on the harvest? What would you guys do? Would you rather pay tax on the seed or the harvest? Let me ask you this. Anyone want to pay tax on the harvest? Does anyone want to pay tax on the harvest? No, no. Should be a lot of no's, lots of seeds, lots of nope, no, hell no, absolutely not. No, no, no. Well, what are you doing when you put money in a 401k? Aren't you paying tax on the harvest? You didn't pay tax on the seed because you got the tax deduction on the seed. You're paying tax on the harvest. You guys agree that taxes are going up? Do you think that taxes go up over a long period of time, 10, 15, 20 years? Do taxes go up, down, or sideways? Well, even if they went sideways, they just find more stuff to tax you on. You guys get this, right? But what are we doing? We're paying tax on the harvest, not the seed. We're giving up control of our best dollars today, the ones that are worth the most today. That's what we do. We put it in there. We pay tax on the harvest, not the seed. And then we ride the roller coaster and we wonder what happened because we gave up control. Here's your card. But you know, one of the things that a lot of people do is you're taught to put your money in 401k plans, employer sponsored plans. And when you do that, your money goes into whatever basket of mutual funds your employer offers you or the financial company offers you. And you know, that's it. You give up control of your good dollars today in hopes of making big returns in this basket of mutual funds. And then you take the money back later. But what if there was a way where you could actually use the money in your 401k without penalties, okay, without taxes, you could just use it to do similar things to what I just mentioned a second ago. Well, there is, and it's actually very lucrative right now because of the CARES Act. So now you have access to $100,000 instead of just 50 in your 401k, and you can take it out as a loan. So if you've got a 401k, not all 401ks offer loans, but most of them do. You could then go in and let's just use the same numbers as we did before. What if you took a, a loan, okay, from your 401k, you just went to your 401k provider and you had 200 grand in there and you took $100,000 out as a loan, which is the max you can take right now. Well, number one, you're going to have to pay that loan back and you're going to have to pay that loan back with interest. So that's the bad news. The good news is, is the interest that you're going to pay back in this example, 5%. The interest you're paying yourself back, that's interest that's paid back to your account. So remember what Warren Buffett said. He said, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. That's his secret sauce for making money in the stock market. And it's, that's all you ever need to know. If all you did <coughs> was buy low, okay, March, March you know, of 2020, sell high, today would be a nice day to sell because it's way high, okay? Buy low, sell high, well, then you couldn't lose money because if you just followed that strategy, you wouldn't lose money. But so many people get greedy and they keep their money in thinking that this, this, gravy train of the market going up is never going to end. Well, I assure you it's going to end and probably sooner than later. It's an election year. So just give it a little bit of time. But what if you took a loan from your 401k? What you'd have to do is you'd have to sell out of the basket of mutual funds that you have available, meaning you sold high. 
You took that loan and you went out and you did something like what we talked about with the home equity line. You did a private loan and you charged 10%. And then what would be the spread? Well, it'd be the $5,000 again, right? Because if you're only paying 5% in interest on your loan to either your 401k, but remember you keep that 5%. The home equity line of credit, the bank keeps that 5%. This scenario, you are the bank. Your 401k gets all of the interest that you pay back. So 5%, that five grand, that went back to your account, but you still had to pay that 401k back. So we don't want to make you work harder. So what you gotta do, you gotta make that money work harder than you. So you take the hundred grand and you put that money out there at 10%, you do a private loan. You invest in a private fund like West Coast Income and earn 10%. Now, the same thing happens here. You're making $5,000. That's the spread between what you're paying and what you're making. But here, you're actually making way more than that. Because you're not just making the $416 a month, which is the spread. You're also keeping the 5% interest that you're paying yourself back. You see... This is such a simple strategy. This strategy would work for credit cards even better because take that 10% out, forget that, that $100,000. Let's say you had $100,000 in credit card debt. That's a lot, but let's just use the numbers that are up here. If you took a loan from your 401k at 5% and all you did is paid off all your credit cards and your credit cards, let's just say had an average uh, interest rate of 15%. So let's just do the math real quick. So if you had $100,000 and that $100,000 was charged 15%, well, you'd be giving up $15,000 per year, okay? You'd be giving that to the credit card company, 15 grand. But now, if you just took that loan out and you paid those credit cards and you took that 15 grand that you used to pay to the credit cards and you just paid it back to yourself, well, how much did you just make? Now you made an additional 5% on that. You made the 15,000 plus the interest you paid yourself back and this would just pay it back. Literally the money you're giving away to the credit cards, when you take that money back because you pay the credit cards off using your loan, you just use that money to pay back the loan. And you literally, whatever you're paying the credit card companies, that's how much interest you're now making because you're, pay, you're paying yourself now. And I could go on for days. I don't want to go too long in that, but that is such an a simple, easy strategy. And I've helped a whole bunch of you do this with loans from your 401k to pay off your debts because your debts, you're paying more on your debts than you're probably earning in your 401k right now. Even if your 401k is doing really well, I have a hard time believing your 401k is beating what Visa is charging you on that credit card. True or true? Well, look at your credit card statement. What are they charging you? 20, 24, 27? Who's got a 29% credit card? That's right. Are you making 20, 24, 29% on your 401k? If the answer is no, look at this strategy. And it doesn't have to be 100 grand. It could be 10 grand. It could be three grand. Whatever your credit cards are, use your 401k to pay the credit cards off, but then be an honest banker and take the money from your credit card that you were giving them and put that back to your 401k. It's a win-win, folks. It's a win-win. And it's just making your money work harder. It's, it's, it's really good stuff. And, you know, you can do that with an active 401k or, or employer, employer plan, which is even better, right? Um, and then those of you that have an old 401k, a job that you've left, I can't tell you how many people we talk to that, that have those, they kind of just forget about them. You know what I mean? That's money we could put to work immediately. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people are furloughed. Okay. Those people have old 401ks. So maybe some of you are in that boat. What can you do with your old 401k? Ever hear of a self-directed IRA? Any, ever hear of a self-directed 401k? How many of you are self-employed? How many of you have an entity that you're the sole operator and sole owner of? You have no employees. Listen, folks, one of the greatest vehicles out there, in, in my opinion, is what they call a solo 401k or a self-directed 401k. Now, I know I talk about self-directed IRAs. Now, if you don't have an entity, and you got money in an old 401k or an old IRA and you're looking to be in control of it. Moving it to a self-directed IRA is awesome, but you, let's take an extra step today. A solo 401k, okay, is, it, which is commonly known as a, they go by several names, QRPs, but is, is commonly known as a self-directed 401k. If you are a sole operator, the only employee of your entity, you qualify for a solo K. Now, they're a little, they cost more. How much does it cost to open a self-directed IRA? If you don't know a guy like me, it's about 350 bucks in setup fees and the small annual fee that they charge. You know a guy like me, you call Horizon Trust, it doesn't, we waive the 350 bucks and then it's just a small annual fee for you know, basically an administration fee, which is very small. So that's what a self-directed IRA costs, very, very little. 
a solo K is going to cost you, I don't know what, anyone know how much they're charging for them? 2,500. I think you got to set the trust up, do some legal work, get the entity set up. But let's just say it costs you 2,500 bucks to set up your solo 401k. By doing that, you now just gave yourself all sorts of options. Literally, you gave yourself options to get more tax deductions on money. You can get more money in it. You put yourself in full control of your money because now you have the option, just like we talked about with the regular 401ks with the loans, you now have a loan provision. But how about in a loan provision, what if your administrator of your solo 401k just said, here you go. Shana, here is your checkbook for your 401k. Now that's dangerous. Here's your checkbook, right? You can now write checks from your 401k, but don't get too excited. Don't you dare go buy a flat screen TV or anything like that. That you get, there's a lot of rules and you got to have a custodian that understands the rules. So the rules are basically, you're going to take loans from your 401k. You could go buy real estate. You could go buy notes. You could lend money to Billy Joe. You could do any of those things that we just talked about with the 401k, but now you're in full control. Now, do you have to pay that money back? Yes. But who's in control of the terms? You are. I'm always talking about you being in control of your money. Folks, the solo 401k for your qualified retirement plan is the control that you need. You just got to learn a little bit more. Where do you learn about it? The book, or there's a bunch of information. Go on YouTube and just look up solo case. Tons of stuff out there. You need to understand how these vehicles work because there's like a couple trillion dollars sitting in four in IRAs out there. Let's get them moved over into, I, into these self-directed IRAs or these solo case. So, Curly says, I got a SEP uh, and self-banking. So a SEP is a simplified employee pension. Nothing more than a sole employer, okay? Much like Cur Curly here, okay? They set up a SEP so they can put more money away. But instead, a SEP is a defined, or a defined benefit plan. A 401k is a defined contribution plan. Not getting technical there. They're just different. A pension is a benefit, a defined benefit. Someday later, you're going to have a specific benefit. A defined contribution plan is a 401k or an IRA. It, it's just, you're, you're defining your contribution. You're telling it how much you want to contribute each year. It's about all it is. So I'm not trying to get in the weeds on that stuff. Um, let's see, Andrea is asking, can you just deposit monies into a self-directed IRA from your savings? Sure, up to the limits. So you certainly can. It's just, you just, you can only deposit into your self-directed IRA up to the limits. And depending on your age, you might have catch-ups and the limits change every year. So the best thing is I can tell you what the limits are, but just Google it. Because I want you to start getting used to doing things yourself. I can keep telling you all this stuff, but it's just easier if you learn where these resources are. You just go to the Oracle, which I call is Google. I said the Oracle, I call it Google, but Google, I call it the Oracle. And type in um, contribution limits for IRAs 2020 or contribution limits for IRAs 2021. They, they always go up. And you can do the same thing for solo case. So just get used to doing that. But yes, you can contribute to it. You get a tax deduction. I would highly suggest if you don't have one yet and you're looking to set up one of these vehicles, that whole traditional part, uh-uh. Let's talk Roths. Because you know what? I always talk to you about paying tax on the seed, not the harvest, right? Well, if you put money into a traditional 401k, essentially you're, you're admitting that you want to pay tax on the harvest, not the seed, because you're getting a deduction on the deposit today, your, your contribution, but you're paying tax on the entire amount later. Let's talk about a Roth 401k or a Roth self-directed 401k, or you're commonly known as Roth solo, okay? Or a Roth self-directed IRA. All Roth is, is it basically just means that the money is going to go in after tax and you're going to take it all out tax-free. Your contribution to a Roth IRA is tax. It's already been taxed. That money's after tax dollars. You got paid. You paid tax to the government. You make a deposit to your Roth. You paid tax on the seed. Someday later, when you take money from that Roth, it's all tax-free. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a wholesaler, real estate wholesaler. So you go out and you got a Roth uh, let's just say you got a Roth self-directed IRA, okay? And you find a deal and you have to put an earnest money deposit of $1,000 down. So you, you do a, a direction to invest from your self-directed Roth IRA for $1,000 and you pay $1,000 to the escrow agent, title or attorney, and they hold your thousand bucks. You then go out and find a buyer. You call Chris and you say, Chris, I got this great deal in Williamsville. I picked it up for a hundred. I want a $5,000 or actually let's round it up. Let's do $10,000 assignment. The house is worth 250. 
I'm going to buy that. Okay. I'm going to give you $110,000. $100,000 is going to go to the seller of the house. $10,000 is going to go back to your self-directed Roth IRA. Okay. You, you follow that. We put $1,000 in escrow to hold that contract. That's your escrow deposit. You made 10,000 from me. I paid you 10,000 at the closing of that deal, but I didn't pay you. I paid your self-directed Roth IRA. So now how much money did you just make on that one transaction for 1,000? So you took, you had $1,000 in your Roth self-directed IRA and you just made 10. How many of you wanna pay tax on $11,000? And how many of you wanna pay tax on $1,000? Hmm? Which one is it? You wanna pay tax on 1,000 or do you wanna pay tax on 11,000? That's what the Roth does. You, that profit you just made of $10,000 on that one assignment deal that you made to me, that's $10,000 in profit. It is all tax-free inside the Roth wrapper. So that's why you use Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs. They're just a better way. Pay tax on the seed, not the, not the harvest. That's what we always say. All right. So I went long on that. Let's see what questions we got. Michael said, can this be done with funds in the stock market? Sure. You just got to sell the funds. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Um, can this be done with funds in the stock market? Yes. If you have funds in the stock market, could you sell the stocks that you are invested in right now, take the gains and then do everything we're talking about? Sure you can. Sure you can. I think if that's what we're talking about, um, maybe you mean you got, um, stocks or mutual funds in your 401k, when you take a loan, you're going to sell those positions. So if you have a mutual fund, a Fidelity Magellan fund, let's just say, that Fidelity Magellan would sell so that you could take the loan. Because you can't take a loan of, of funds. You have to take a loan from cash. And to get cash, you got to sell. Buy low, sell high, don't lose money, right? Just always remember that. Let's see. We got a question here that says, can I withdraw from my Roth without getting taxed? That's a great question and an interesting answer. So the technical term, and you want to look this up and check with your CPA, always check with your CPA, but here's the technical term. The answer is yes, after five years. Prior to five years, the answer would be no. You could take out the money up to the principal that you put in, up to your cost basis. Okay, that would be tax-free because that's just your deposit. You already paid tax on that. But any gain in the first five years would be taxed. Any gain plus the deposit you made after the fifth year, technically and hypothetically is tax-free. Check with your CPA. There are, some, there are some little caveats with that. If you're 59 and a half, okay, can you withdraw from your Roth without getting taxed? If you're 59 and a half, absolutely. You could take all of your money out of your Roth, 100% tax-free. So you hear, hear how I did that. The first time I was talking pre-59 and a half. So if you're not 59 and a half and you've got money in a Roth, you can take the money from your Roth up to your basis tax-free in the first five years. But anything above and beyond your basis, which is your deposits, would be taxed hypothetically in the first five years. CARES Act provides some, some special rules with that. But after the fifth year, hypothetically, again, check with your CPA, you could take all the money out pre-59 and a half, but then there's a 10% IRS penalty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a simple four-step process on how you can build wealth, enjoy it today, taking on no risk and losing zero control of your money. And the best part about this is you don't have to work any harder or any longer to do it. So basically, here's the biggest thing. You know, one of the things that we do at the money school and the money multipliers, we teach people how to take back the money that you're giving away to everybody else. Simply put, out of $1 that you make, you give up 90 cents of that dollar to everybody else. And all we need to do to build wealth is just take back the money that we're giving to everybody else, which in theory sounds simple, right? But the application is not quite so easy. But you know what? So many of you have the answer to your money problems right under your nose. And what is that answer? The money's sitting there. You've been putting money away your whole life to save for this thing called retirement. You know, that, that fictitious day when someday we get to retire, sail off into the sunset, and life is perfect. Well, statistically, not quite. So, that's not quite what happens. You see, statistically, what happens is about out of 100 people, 95% of them are not financially secure at that time. 95% of them have to make other decisions. Some of them decide to work until they're into the 65, 75, 85 not because they want to, but because they have to. I don't want that to be you. And I can tell you why that's the case. And the case is 
We give too much money away to everybody else. So let's dive right into it. So here we go. I'm going to teach you how to make money with money you already have. Essentially, your 401k monies or your 403b, 457, any of those employer-sponsored retirement plan dollars that you have, that's what we're going to do. And here's the situation. So we're not going to work any harder. We're not going to work any longer. We're not going to take on any risk, zero risk. You take on enough, enough risk with your money right now. The stock market, all these risky investments you're doing, bonds, all the mutual funds, the ETFs, too much risk. We don't want to take on any risk, zero. We don't want to work any longer. We don't want to work any harder. Do you guys want to work harder? I don't. I want to work smarter. And most importantly, we are not going to lose control of our money. You see, that's what we've been taught our whole life is how to give up control of the money that we make. That's what we've been taught. That's why we put our money in 401ks. That's why we give everybody else control of our money except for ourselves. You've been taught to do that. Well, not anymore, because here's how it's going to change. So let's just say that this side right here represents the money that you have saved in your 401k. Now, folks, don't get hung up on the numbers. This is just an example. But let's assume that you have $100,000 in your 401k. I'm going to do two examples. I'll do one for $50,000, too. But you got hundred grand in your 401k. And let's just pretend that that hundred grand is making 7%. So what does that mean? That would mean that you'd be making $7,000 per year. But you know what else that means? That, money, that means that your money will double in 10 years. Now let's talk about $50,000 because this seems to be the, the common number that I hear people say. So let's just say you only got 50,000. Well, 50,000, this is 100 here. So if you only had 50,000, well, at 7%, which is the rule of 72. That's all this is. The seven, it's 7.2%, 7 but that money doubles in 10 years. $50,000 at 7% will make 3,500 bucks. That's what most of you are doing. And what else are you doing? Well, you're also riding the roller coaster of the market. You know that? How are, where are we at right now? Well, are any of you guys ready to start riding this roller coaster down? You guys like that roller coaster? Because I certainly don't. You know what I like? I like my money making this right at the top, right? So how do we do that? Well, where's your money going? So who do you give all of your money to? Don't, is, don't we give some money to credit cards? Well, the first thing we have to understand is the rules of 401k. See, the step number one, what you need to do is you need to call your 401k provider and you need to ask them, are loans allowed? Can you take a loan from your 401k? Once you know that, if the answer is yes, so if you can take a loan, what we're going to do is you're going to take a loan. Now, normally, normally you can take 50,000 or 50% 50 of the money in your 401k. So if we had a hundred grand, you could take 50, which is why I'm going to use the number 50. But right now during COVID, because of the CARES Act, you can take out up to $100,000. So it doesn't matter what the numbers are, just do the math. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically look at who you're giving money to. Let's just assume that some of you are, are in credit card debt. And let's just assume you have $25,000 worth of credit card debt. This is probably the worst kind of debt that you can have. And if you have credit card debt, now I know a lot of people have different interest rates, but let's just pretend that your credit card debt, they're dinging you for 19.99%. Why do I use that? because that's the number on most credit cards, 19.99, 19.97. Forget about these 0% cards because those are limited. And if you screw up once, you're late one time, you bump up to the higher rate, which is much higher than 19.99. So if you're paying on $25,000, if you're paying 19.99%, you're paying roughly $4,997.50. That's how much money you're giving away to them every single month. So every single month, that money is leaving your family forever. You'll never get that money back. It's gone. And we don't even think anything of it. The credit card company doesn't mail you a thank you card. So what if we just changed one thing? What if we went to our 401k and we took a loan? Now, when you take a loan, there's a couple things you need to understand. When you take a loan from your 401k, you have to pay that money back. So if you get paid bi-weekly, you're going to have to pay that loan back 
every other week. So whatever your pay period is, every paycheck will be reduced by the loan repayment. And I understand that. So there's no free lunch here. I can show you better ways, but there's no free lunch. So this 50,000 bucks is gonna cost you 5% interest. That's your loan interest, okay? So the loan will cost you 5% interest. So how much is 5%? 2,500 bucks. All right, so let's just assume now, let's just take these numbers that we're working with here. And if we've got 2,500 that it's gonna cost us in those loans, of course, my thing's gonna start falling here. There we go. If we've got $2,500 in interest cost, it's gonna cost us on that 401k, who gets that money? Who gets that 2,500 in interest that the 401k is charging you? Is it the 401k company? Okay, is it your, your boss? The, the company you work for, or is it you? Well, for any of you that said this money goes to you, you are absolutely correct. You get the interest on the 401k. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna basically take a loan from our 401k for $25,000, okay? So we're gonna take a loan, a loan for 25,000 and we're gonna basically have that money come over here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pay off. We're gonna pay off that credit card. Now that credit card was 25,000. So we took a loan for 25,000 and we pay off that credit card. So now the credit card is gone, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one additional step, one additional step, okay? Whatever amount you were giving to that credit card company, you're gonna pay back to your, you're gonna pay it back to your, yourself, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this $4,997 that you used to give away. And you know what we're gonna do? We're going to now give it to yourself in doing so what did you just do well no new money was created here this was money you already had in your 401k we just simply took a loan and this credit card money was money you were giving away every month you bought some things but no big deal all we're going to do is we're going to then take back the money that you were giving away to the credit card companies we call this recycle and recapture so all you're going to do is you're going to recycle and you're going to recapture the money you were giving away to the credit card company. So now you just made yourself, so you move it over here, you made yourself $4,997.50. Now that's only on 25,000 of it. We still have 50 grand we're going to use, right? So what else? Well, let's just assume one more. How about you got a $25,000 car loan? Let's just call this your car loan. Your car loan, if you had a $25,000 car loan, most car loans, I'm just going to use 6%. Now, you guys might get them lower, but this is just an example. And at 6%, your car is going to cost you $483 a month. So that means that every single month, you're writing $483 to the finance company that, that gave you the money to buy your car. And in exchange, you get to drive your car. Now, what does your car do every single year you own it? It goes down in value. And it needs maintenance. The older they get, the more maintenance they need. But the value of that vehicle goes down. So you're literally trading dollars for a depreciating asset. But that's okay. We all need a car to drive. So that 483 works out to be 57.96 a year. That's how much money you're trading. Of which 6% of that is interest that you're giving away. Again, here we go again. We are giving money away to somebody else in exchange for the right to now drive the car. But we want to change the dynamic. I want to show you how to take back the wealth that you're giving away. So very simply, all we're going to do is we're going to take another loan from our 401k. So down here, if I were to draw another arrow, we're going to take a second loan for 25,000 or maybe the first one. This is just a loan from your 401k. Okay. So we took that loan. Now let's make sure we got all the right colors on here. We took that loan from your 401k. And what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to pay off the money that you're giving to the car company. So we're gonna pay off the car loan, but we're not gonna just be like, okay, car loan's paid off. No, we're gonna take this $483 and we're gonna basically pay that back to yourself. So we're gonna recycle and recapture the money that you're giving away. How much is that? Right here, folks. We're gonna recycle and recapture the $5,796 a year that you were giving away for the car. Now the car is bought and paid for, you paid for it using a loan from your 401k. And now how much money did you actually just make? Well, that money shifts over to this side. So now we've got an additional $5,796 that you just made. So if we were to add all this up, how much did we just make? Well, 
We just made $49.97 by paying off the credit cards and recapturing that. And then we made $57.96 by recapturing the car payments that you were making to somebody else. Now, all these payments are coming back to you, going back into your account. How much of that money has to go back into the 401k? Well, only the 50,000 that you borrowed. So over time, did you not cover the amount that you're paying back? You sure did. And did you have to work any harder, work any longer? Did you have to give up control? Did you have to take on any risk? No, you actually made 19.99% up here. I can't say it's guaranteed, but it pretty much is because you're going to pay yourself back the money that you were given the credit cards and you just made 19% plus down here, you just made 6% by doing what? Just taking back the money that you were giving away to everybody else. That's all you did. And in doing that, you now made the equivalent of that, which is a, a, over 10 grand. You now made over 10 grand. How much were you making on that 50,000 at 7%? 3,500. How much are you making now? Over $10,000, folks. Nothing changed. You just did one thing different. You followed a couple steps. You called your 401k company and asked them, are loans permitted? When they said yes, you asked how much? Normally it's 50% or 50,000, but now in 2020, because of COVID and the CARES Act, you can take out up to a hundred thousand bucks. That's right. So we've got up to 50 to hundred grand available money that's in our 401k that's for that rainy day that who knows if retirement's ever gonna happen. Statistically, most people won't enjoy retirement like they think. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna just take that money and we're gonna move it over to this side. We're gonna pay off credit cards, recycle and recapture the money, okay? Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another loan. We're gonna pay off the car loan. We're gonna recycle and recapture that money. All in the same, you're making double, more than double the money that you were making in the market. Now, I, I understand some of you are like, well, I made more than 7%. Yeah, until this happens. You see, to make this money here doesn't require the markets to do anything. You don't have to have your 401k assets, your mutual funds, your ETFs, your stocks, your bonds. They don't have to make any money because you're making all the money by driving your car and making those payments. You're making all the money by just taking back the payments that you were giving away to the credit card companies. You see how simple this is? This is how you build wealth. And this is how you build wealth through your own debts and expenses. 401k would work the same exact way. Let's say you work for a company. You got your fancy employer sponsored 401k plan. You put money into it every single pay period because they give you a tax deduction, which you're thinking is great. And then they give you a match and you're like, that's great, great. I get a tax deduction plus I get a match. It is great, but really what you're doing is you're taking a tax deduction on the seed, which you should be paying tax on the seed, but you've foregone paying tax on the seed to pay tax on the harvest. So you can either pay tax on the seed or get the tax deduction on the seed. And either way you do it, you're going to basically pay the piper later or you're not going to pay the piper later. It's one or the other. But you got this 401k. Sorry, I went down a rabbit hole. You're putting money into it and all that money is in the market. Well, let, right now would probably be a great time to look at that 401k and say, you know, maybe, maybe just maybe I'm a bit scared. Maybe I'm going to pull that money and I just want to put it on the sidelines. So you can do that. You can move it into cash or the most conservative investment inside that 401k, or you could actually take a loan from your 401k and repeat the process of what I just talked about with the hidden equity. So maybe you're a real estate investor. Maybe you want to buy notes. Maybe you want to buy tax liens. Maybe you want to learn how to flip land. Take a loan from your 401k and then use that to go buy the land and then wholesale the land. Use that to go buy your first flip. Use that to go buy your rental property. Use that to pay off your credit cards. You see what I'm saying? It just goes on and on and on. But don't ever forget the most important part. Remember, in everything we teach you about money, it's important to move your money out, but it's also important to take the money that you make and move it back in. It's a circle, just draw a circle on a board. We wanna move the money from the left of the circle to the right, where the money sits to where the money is gonna to go to work for you. But then we wanna take that working money and take the money that it makes and move it back to the left. One circle, you need to just keep doing that. It's exactly what a bank does over and over and over. You could do the same thing with your 401k. And the cool thing about using a 401k, not only is when you take a loan, it forces your money out of the market, meaning you just sold high. Okay. The market's at a high point. So you just got out at the high point, but now we've got money in cash, which Chris, we don't want money in cash. Inflation's chewing my cash alive. Great. Let's then take that money out and let's do one of these things we just talked about. Pay off Visa. And then 
take the 200 or $300 a month you were given to Visa and put it back into your 401k. The math is the same, 5% interest on your 401k, but there's one big difference. So in this scenario, if it was the same as the HELOC, if it was costing me 5% to borrow the money from my 401k and I was earning 10, I make 5,000. We just went over that in the home equity line. But what's different about your 401k versus your home equity line? The difference is who gets the interest. Your 401k, when you repay that money back to your 401k, that 5% interest that's charged on the loan from the retirement account goes back into your account. It does not go to your 401k provider and it does not go to the financial firm. It goes to you. So now on top of the five grand, what did you also make? 5%, the 5% you paid yourself back on. That was the interest you're putting back in your account. Like this strategy could be used over and over, but let's just say you, let's say you don't uh, still have your job. You left your job. Now you've got this old 401k sitting out there and you're getting into real estate. You're going to do this land flipping thing, or you're going to do wholesaling with Chris Root. So we take that 401k, we roll it over. Okay. You're what we're going to teach. And I think we're going to get into it next. If we have time, you roll it over to a solo K very much like your 401k, but just for you, solo K. We'll go over the details. Now you take a loan from your solo K and that funds your land flipping business. That funds your wholesale business. And then whatever revenue you generate from that, you just put it back into your 401k. See, there's always an answer. Don't think, oh, well, I can't use my 401k because I don't work for the company anymore. Oh, there's a solution. You just need to learn all these different things. How many of you own mutual funds? Can I can I have anyone on here? Can you tell me in your 401k and your IRA, how many of you own those mutual funds? How many of you have mutual funds? And let's let's actually throw ETFs in there because you know I know ETFs are better than mutual funds, but they're still a creature of the same device. Yes. How many how many else? Jake owns mutual funds. Angie's got mutual funds. Listen, like. Most all of you probably have mutual funds. Unless you've been around our campfire for a while, I bet you any money, most all of you have some or maybe even a lot of mutual funds in your 401ks. Why? You don't have a choice. That's why. Your 401k that's offered by your employer that they give you that match from, guess what they give you the option to invest in? Mutual funds. What else is available in your 401k? How many of you can buy individual stocks inside your 401k? I'll bet you it's less than 1% of 1% of the people on here. How many of you have ETFs, which this should just be a common thing. How many of you have ETFs available in your 401k? Maybe 5% or less. That's a, that's a damn shame. So the only option you have in your 401k, and, and just so everybody knows the number for how many people have money in 401ks, I, I wrote all this stuff down, is it's, it's crazy. It's like 85% of all people have 401ks in one form or the other. About 44 trillion, I said that right, 44 trillion dollars in this country have their money in 401ks. And this, what I'm going to show you next, is what nobody's being told. All right, and last question, we're going to get into this fee part because this is going to piss you off. All of you that have 401ks, IRAs, or any type of investment account where you're investing with somebody else, your financial advisor, your broker, whatever you want to call them, how many of you, and be honest, please, how many of you have read the prospectus front to back? Come on, let's hear it. You guys have that? If you guys have a variable annuity, the, the prospectus is thicker than the Bible. So I know none of you read it because the typeset is so small, you'd need double powered glasses just to read it. I, I know somebody just said, ha, that's a joke. Nope. Nobody's read the prospectus. Why? Is it because it's above your head? Is it too hard to understand? Is it just not a good use of your time? Or is there just that good information in there that you need to know? Because if you said there's just not good information in there that you don't need to know, you're wrong. Everything you need to know is in that big giant Bible looking prospectus that probably today is only emailed so that you can quickly hit delete because you don't even want to look at it. And in that prospectus, we'll tell you all the things you absolutely should have known before you invest. But here's the funny thing about retirement plans. 401ks, 401ks are the only product, period, the only product that Americans buy that they do not understand. None of you bought your lawnmower because you didn't understand what the lawnmower does and, and how to operate it, right? No, you all know how to do that. None of you bought a car because you didn't understand what that thing does, right? But the 401k is the only product, because it is a product, make no two ways about it, that 
Americans buy and they have no understanding of what it is. They don't know the price or the quality of their 401k. How many of you know what your 401k talks? How many of you know what your 401k costs you? Seriously. How many of you know the quality of the 401k provider or the funds? Again, probably less than 1% of you. And I was just going to say, Chris, and that's another thing. Like when you have a 401k, you're, you're limited to, you know, what funds that 401k provider allows you to pick, you know, and financial advisors are the same way. A lot of people are like, no, this guy's managing my money and whatnot. But no, I mean, you know, I worked for America. Prize Financial, which was American Express Financial Advisors at the time, and they were transitioning, but we couldn't sell other, you know, outside funds or steer people. Like we had to pick what funds Ameriprise offered to their clients that we could pick from. So it wasn't even like we were really going in the best interest of the client because we were so limited in what we could actually recommend. You know, it's just stuff like that. It's just like, man. I love it. And you know, Brent Kessler says it best. And I remember the first time I heard this, I'm like, you know what, son of a pup, he's right. He says, well, how much do, you know, he asks a whole group of people in the crowd. He says, so let me ask all of you, what do you know about your 401k? And then before anyone even says anything, he says, hold on a second. Let me tell you what you know about your 401k. He says, here's what you know about your 401k. You know, whether you invested in conservative, moderate, or high risk, maybe. And then he says, I think he pretty much says that's all they know, but that's pretty much what people know. They don't know anything about their 401k, but they know that if they go to work and they put their money into their 401k, they might have a chance, a hope that they can retire someday. Oh, and they might get a match. So now let's really look at what that 401k is because no one understands it. Nobody understands the dangers. Very few of you, if any of you are reading the prospectus, which holds all the answers to what I'm about to show you. And somebody had mentioned Vanguard and I love that they mentioned Vanguard. Now, listen, I might be beating up on mutual fund companies right now, but I will tell you, I have a tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for the gentleman who started Vanguard funds. Vanguard funds is an indexed fund family. That's all they have is indexed funds. Okay. With the lowest fees quote, well, Some would say nowadays it's not, but they used to have the lowest fees in the industry on mutual funds. So Vanguard, if you have them, you're a little bit better than what I'm about to show you. So here we go. Let's talk about mutual fund fees. How many of you have a variable annuity? You don't have to even tell me because I know you're probably embarrassed or you just have no idea what you have. I used to sell a lot of variable annuities. You know why I sold variable annuities? I was told to. You know why else? Steven, did you ever sell those things at Ameriprise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, um, they tend Why did to pay we sell good, them too. though? What, what was the biggest driving force that our brokers and our consultants told us? What was the big thing after they told us how sweet these shitty vehicles were, but that how they painted this great picture? What was the last thing they would always tell us? Well, they tend and to pay good. you get paid a big old rip, right? A big old commission, mm-hmm. 4%, 6%. Absolutely. So think about that. The advisor takes your money, rolls it over from that old 401k from that old job, moves you into a variable annuity they know they're getting paid four, five, six, maybe even 7%. Do the math, folks. On 100,000, that's 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, $7,000. How many of you would be okay making that by suggesting a product? But what they don't realize is how much they're hurting their client. Because annuities are the worst of every one of these we're going to talk about. And then ETFs and et cetera. So let me talk about the different things that most of you don't see when you look at it from a fee standpoint. Here's- and one, thing, Go ahead. one thing, Chris, real fast. One thing I do want to just put a caveat on all this, okay? If you, you know, somebody, it just reminded me that somebody said they've been with Ameriprise over 25 years. So if you have a financial advisor now, if you've been with a financial planning firm, we're not saying that's a bad thing, okay? Oh. What we're saying is for some people, that's fine. But guess what? Odds are not in your favor that that's going to turn out well for you. Okay. But I also understand that being able to spend a couple hours a week to learn something new, being able to spend a few hours a month to implement a new strategy, not everybody has what it takes to do that. So, you know, it's not hard to like for, I'll give you one example. It's not hard to join our private money club, spend 30 minutes on the phone with me, helping decide, you know, what might work going out, finding a place to, to invest your money. That's going to pay you great returns. It's going to be secured in first position by a piece of real estate. That's going to stay strong. So it's going to eliminate a lot of the risk. 
it doesn't take a lot of time to do that. You stick the money in there, whether it's a retirement account or whatever, and it's going to sit there for the next three, four, five years and you're good to go. You don't even have to think about it again, but it took three to five hours of education and implementation to set that up for the next 35 years. Not everybody's willing to do that. So I just want to say that, you know, you know, if you don't mind taking the risk of, Hey, let's hope that this works out for me, or let's hope that my financial advisor has my best interest in, in, in mind. Hey, it works out sometimes. Right. But if you really want to make sure that you're going to be able to live the life that you want, that those, you, those are the ones that we want to work with. Those are the ones that we want to keep on these trainings. We want you coming back every week. We want you to join us for our three-day trainings because you're the ones that we want to work with that are willing and understand that. So I just want to throw that caveat out there real quick. Very important. Very important. So, you know, back to the fees, cause I'm not done pissing you off yet. Like we're, we're just, I'm just warming you up. I'm prepping you. I'm like getting you ready for what's coming. So what fees do you pay that you didn't read in that prospectus commissions? Yeah. You guys are like, Oh, we already know about that. You and Steven get paid commissions on those banking policies. Indeed we do markups from your broker dealer. Hmm, what are those? Sales loads. You know what those are? Surrender charges on those annuities, those IULs, index universal lifes, or those variable universal lifes that everybody loves to sell in the broker world because they get paid a big commission. Operating expenses, 12B1 expenses, 401k fees, they're buried. Uh, you, you think 401k fees are free or 401k plans are, fee, are free? They're not. Do you think the company pays them or you do? You do, of course, the participants pay for. Why would the company pay for something that they tout as being like the greatest gift they could have given you? No, you pay for those. m and &E expenses, you guys know what those are? VA fees, investment advisory fees, management fees. I could keep going, but I'm just getting bored of even saying it. All of those, and what do those actually look like? What do those impact your portfolio? Well, let's look at it. Here's the examples of compounding fees on a $100,000 portfolio over 20 years. I just did simple math, $100,000 portfolio over 20 years. And again, there's my disclosure, folks. You guys want to see this. All this information I'm about to give you came from the sec.gov website. There's the sheet that I pulled all this off. I even printed it out in color because I was taking this stuff serious. If you had zero fees, which you can't invest money, anyone know how to invest money without any fees? It's pretty impossible, right? So this is unlikely, but 100,000 is what you started with. Over 20 years, if all you made is 4%, and I, I conveniently picked 4%, why? Because that's what these privatized banking policies pay you up to this year. How many of you remember from prior times of us talking about these privatized banking policies paying you a guaranteed 4%? You guys all know that, right? 4% guaranteed? How many of you know that that ends at the end of this year? Not if you already have a policy, that will be in per perpetuity because you're grandfathered, but does everybody realize that at the end of this year, the government's 7702 will start being applied by insurance companies and the guaranteed interest rate is going to drop. Ding, ding, ding. The fire bells are going off. It's a fire sale. It is right. Like, but that's where the 4% comes from. No fee. So your money, your hundred grand would have grown to 222,000 over 20 years at 4%. Not bad. Not bad, right? You went from hundred to 222. You didn't have to work any harder. Your money just grew at 4%. But I already told you, it's pretty much impossible to invest your money, make a return consistently and persistently every day in the markets, okay, and do it with no fee. So let's just let's just look at fees. 0.25%. This would be like maybe an ETF, okay, or maybe one of the really good index funds at Vanguard. Maybe it's 25 basis points. Your 100 would have grown to 210,000. So which means over that 20 years you spent $12,000 in fees. And some of you are thinking, well, that's not too bad, Chris, man, I, I, I wouldn't mind 25 basis points, but what was the future earning potential of that 12,000? Don't forget that. Remember each year, actually each quarter or, or monthly, sometimes that fee comes out, which means you have less and less money growing. So even at a 0.25 basis point, you lost 12 grand plus whatever that 12 grand would have grown to, but let's keep going. How about 50 basis points, half of a percent. If you paid on your mutual fund, which I don't know many mutual funds except for index funds that pay or charge 0.5. And also too, when, when you are told, oh, the, the expense charge is 0.25, you're like, oh, cheap one. Don't forget to read the prospectus. Don't forget about the 12B1 fees, the broker markups, all the things mutual funds do that aren't in your best favor, but make them the most amount of money. Let's not forget about those. Half a percent, 200 would have grown, or I'm sorry, your 100 would have gone to 200. 
you gave up $22,000 in the future earning potential on 22. But now let's get to what's realistic. How many of you have had an advisor? Because I know this is what I charge. That charges you 1% management fee. And then they take that 1%. Let's just assume that's the only thing you're paying, which it wouldn't be. You'd pay 1% plus you'd probably pay a separately managed account fee, plus you'd pay the mutual fund fees, plus the 12B1 fees. Uh, okay, I'm going on and on. Stephen's going to fall asleep if I keep going with the fees. But just 1%, your 100 would have grown to 180. That's a $42,000 haircut, plus the ability for what that 42,000 could have made. This is what you're taught to do, folks. Who's winning? If you earned a 7% return, let's get away from the four. If you earned a 7% return on your money, and you paid a 2% fee. And just so all of you know, except for you Vanguard folks, most of you are probably paying 2% or more. Any of you that have variable annuities, sorry, it's north of 2%. I don't know. Stephen, you ever do a variable annuity that was less than 2%? No. That's right. 2%. So we're just going to figure 2%. You know who came up with this right here? Not me. The founder of Vanguard. This is direct from his mouth. I just wrote it down. If you made 7%, you paid a 2% fee over 50 years. Over 50 years, I know it's a long time, you could break it down any way you want. You lost two thirds of your portfolio. How many of you think two thirds is a lot of money? Because if you don't, man, oh man, we have a lot more work to do if that's what you think. You would have lost two thirds of your money. That right there is sickening. It really is sickening that that's how this works. And you know, some of the rules to avoid these pitfalls are actually so simple. And I wrote them all down. How about the rule of 100 for retirement, the retirement gamble? If you're not planning to live to age 100, you are planning to fail. Okay, write that down. Rule number one, if you're not planning to live to 100, you are planning to fail. Rule number two, this used to be called the 4% rule. I call it the 2.5% rule. If you take out more than 2.5% from your portfolio each year, and you don't have somebody managing it and having a, a portfolio where you can take money from a safe place and down markets and all this. But let's just say you take more than two and a half percent, chances are you're going to run out of money before you hit your final graduation date of 100 or whatever that is. Interest rate ri risk. Rates are low. If they go up, your debts potentially could cost more. Think about it right now. We're all using debt. All of us. Me, Stephen, we're all using debt. Okay. Okay. And interest rates are really low right now. You're locking in mortgages. You're locking in car loans at close to zero. If interest rates go up and your next car you buy, you got to pay 5% instead of zero with the Toyota Finance Company or whatever company is doing that. Can you afford that increase in interest rates? I don't know. Stock market risk. We already talked about that. The volatility risk. If the market next year drops 50%, are you okay? If the market in two years from now drops 60%, are you okay? If the market in three years from now drops 30, 40, 50%, are you okay? Can you weather that? Can you hold out? Most of you, 90 plus percent of you, the answer is no, you can't. What would your, what would the brokerages and the big mutual fund companies say? It's just a paper loss. Just hang in there. Just invest for the long haul. Bullshit, bullshit, and bullshit. You can't, you can't do it. Try it. How many of you tried doing that in 2008? Did anyone literally, and, and I want, I want, I want to literally give somebody the ability to literally be the hero today. Who on here today had money invested in 2008 and you touched none of it and you wrote out the 2008 recession? How many of you actually can say you did that without taking your money and moving into cash without, you know, changing anything? Did anyone invest for the long haul in 2008? Lost everything. Jim did. Okay. So Jim is literally a superhero. Donna is a superhero. Who else? Julie is a superhero. I didn't touch their money then. Cindy, superhero. Of course, this would be that one 5% group where a bunch of people didn't. But I bet you, you know, we got 130 people on here. For all the people are saying that they did, that's awesome. We got a lot of superheroes. You see, that is rare that those people held out through 2008 and actually could because most people fear hit them. They got really scared. They panicked. Reality set in. They lost their job. They couldn't afford things. They couldn't put food on the table, pay for their car payment, pay college tuition, and they pulled out, which means they sold low. Those superheroes that you just heard from were the ones that actually rode that roller coaster out. But now one other question for all of you super, superheroes on here who literally rode that out, 
and you can say you did, how did it feel? How did that feel? In the moment when the market was down 40, 50%, were you thinking, holy shit, it was painful, it was scary, it sucked. They were in a very unique situation where they could weather that storm. But now, all of those people that rode that out, let's just say they were retiring a year. Let's say 2008 hit and they were planning to retire in 2009. How many of them could have let that money ride? None of them. They would have needed to start taking an income. These are the realities I'm talking about. And I know I'm going into this, but you got to understand the market is designed to take it back from you. You can't weather that. So the market, the stock market risk is one that none of you can avoid if you're in the markets when you're ready to retire. That's why it's, it's, it's a, never going to work. Real estate. Okay. I'm not saying, I think real estate is, and I want to be very clear and transparent. I think real estate is the greatest investment on earth. But I also think a lot of people right now are, are literally leading themselves straight off the edge of a cliff. People are paying stupid, stupid, stupid prices for investment real estate. I'm not talking about your primary house. Listen, if you buy a primary house in this market, listen, we all got to have a place to live. I would probably suggest not buying a house right now and renting a beautiful place until the market drops. And then you can go buy that same house you were going to overpay for 30 cents on the value. But some of you like me have a wife and your wife doesn't want to hear that or a husband and your husband doesn't want to hear that. So you just paid overpriced value for the house. I get it. But real estate, people are jumping into real estate right now for the long haul. And they're, they're going to all have to either do one of two things, sell when the market goes down because they can't hang on to it like people did in 09, 10, 11, and 12, or ride it out, suffer a little bit, painful, scary, awful, or some of the comments of what it was like riding it out. Just be careful. I still think real estate is the greatest investment on earth. Even if you're paying more for the property today than you think you want to, the numbers, the math, the rental, if that will weigh out what you're investing in that property, then good. But ask yourself, can you afford to cover some of the cost if things get hard? That's the thing. And most importantly, single-handedly is Warren Buffett's buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. So when the market's going down, you should be buying. When the market, so everybody that was able to hold out through 2008, I hope that they were buying in 2008, 9, 10, 11, heavily buying. As much as they could put in, they were buying. I hope a bunch of you bought last March like I did, like Sodi did, like Stephen did. We were buying when the market was going down because that's just what you're supposed to do. And when the market went high, what did they? Do? What did some smart investors do? They sell. A lot of people right now should be taking their gains off the table. You're foolish if you don't. I said that, mark me on that. Your advisor is gonna hate me for it. If you're not taking your gains off the table right now, that is foolish. It is irresponsible. It is you taking on risks you don't need to because of FOMO, because of the fear of missing out. So now that I beat all of you up and now I got you guys really fired up, I got, and the numbers keep climbing, which is great. Usually when I piss people off, the numbers go down, but I'm hitting some really important pain bodies. I'm poking your bruise and you know what? That bruise hurts every time I poke it. And that bruise is going to hurt a lot more when we keep poking it and keep poking it. But you're not going to realize the pain until the market crashes. And does the market go down faster than it goes up? Yeah. The market collapses. Why? We live in a digital age of little tripwires, of little domino-like things. When one goes down, it's brrr, the whole thing goes down. You won't be able to stop it. You'll get out a little too late. You're at the top of the mountain now. You're at the top of Mount Everest. Look around. It's beautiful. You're above the clouds. You can go anywhere you want. Where do you go when you're at the top of the market? When you're at the top and you take your money out of the market, then what? Where do you put your money? How do you protect that money? How do you still keep pace with inflation? How do you still beat taxes? What do you do? It's not knowing that it's going to crash. I already told you that's going to happen. It's knowing what to do with your money when it crashes. It's knowing what to do with your money today to weather that crash. You know, what's coming is going to be devastating. That's the easiest way to put it. But I want to clarify that. It's going to be devastating for the sheep, the 95% that conform to what everybody tells them to do. For the 5%, for all of you that join us for the three-day and all of you that have been around the campfire, as Brent Kessler says, this is going to be the biggest opportunity of your life if you know how to play this game. So folks, to the opportunity seekers, to the thrill seekers, to those of you that want to be the bank, that want to make a ton of money and be the light in the darkness, this is your time. 
The next few years are going to be interesting, but they're going to be exciting. So welcome to the road or welcome to the, the ride, I should say. With that being said, we appreciate your time. And that is a wrap, I guess. I, I don't know what else to say. I had something else I was going to say and I forgot right as I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wrap. Lions, not sheep, BYOB. Check this out. Check this out. Ready? It's here, baby. Oh, my goodness. Look at that license. Got the license plates going on my truck next. We're going to end that right there. BYOB. And if you're serious, you get a license plate that says BYOB. Folks, have a good day. We enjoy your company and you being here and joining us to learn how to BYOB. And we'll see you at the Ask Me Anything Happy Hour. We're all going to have a cocktail. Brent Kessler and Hannah Kessler in the house. We'll see you then.